Thanks very much for joining us on Upfront. This is a regular monthly program where we focus on the leaders in the South Vancouver Island community. And today we're excited to welcome Saanich Councillor-elect Karen Harper, the successful candidate of 10 who were running. Garnering about 25% of the vote, Karen had 2,340 votes. At least that was the last time I checked the Sanch website, which was pretty recently. A backgrounder, first of all. Karen is a Massachusetts-born person. She relinquished her American citizenship when she became a Canadian citizen, which was some time ago. <laughs> She's been living in Saanich since the year 2000. She's had a really vibrant 40-year business career, a significant professional experience in education as a French immersion teacher and librarian in Alabama elementary and secondary schools. She also spent time as the first full-time local bargainer for teachers, involved in union issues heavily during her time at the BCTF, including a $100 million disability file. Then Karen moved on to the BC Pension Corporation, where she retired seven years ago after 10 years with the corporation as the chief knowledge officer. And yes, that is or was her formal title. After three or four years of full retirement, it was time to get back to community. And she started with the Amalgamation Yes campaign, getting involved with grumpy taxpayers of Victoria and working on Richard Atwell's campaign. He, in fact, endorsed her candidacy. Karen, welcome to up uh, Front. Thank you. Well, to what do you credit your success in this by-election? I, I think it's um, a number of things, but primarily I would have to say that because I did attend council and I focused on three issues in my campaign, which were essentially fiscal accountability, balancing property rights with environmental stewardship, and uh, land use issues, and particularly development issues, those seem to really resonate with the, the people who supported me, and I think that's probably ultimately what put me over the top. A lot of good candidates. Yeah, there were a, a, an excellent crop of candidates. Those three issues, though, they're all really large and yes. quite complex, and a lot of the people at the various meetings were bringing them up, the residents. Were there any other issues that came up when you were campaigning for residents particularly? There are always other issues that come up. Uh, there were other bylaws that came up. Tree bylaw came up in various iterations. Um, traffic definitely is an issue that came up in various iterations. Governance issues, mm -hmm. even. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about what you observed in the three years in terms of processes at Saanich Council. Uh, you, obviously, you saw a lot, hours and hours of council coverage. So we often talk about uh, mayors and councillors as being very similar to board members in other not-for-profit organizations in terms of being there for governance only and not getting too mixed up in operations. Uh, you reflected a little while ago to me that you saw there was a little bit of a, an issue there. Yeah, I, I have spent a lot of time um, reporting to various <laughs> boards of trustees, for example, on the pension boards, as well as other boards throughout my career, and have been on some boards. And so, yes, it's important for a board to operate at a very strategic level. And one of the things that did engage in my interest was I get the sense that, that Saanich Council is spending too much time, certainly at council meetings itself, on details rather than strategic direction. And, <clears throat> and that's important in order to be an effective leader. It's also important, I think, for staff to know where they are going and what they were doing. And I think staff actually needs, in some areas, more empowerment, in other areas, less empowerment. Mm -hmm. And that will come along with, uh, with a good council that works together well. Speaking of which, uh, what have your observations been of the council members so far? And I imagine you've gotten to know some of them quite well. I've got to know a number of them, some of them quite well, some of them a little bit, but certainly in terms of issues. Um, at the beginning, as we all know, it was an interesting place to be and an interesting <laughs> show to watch. <laughs> I guess it's probably uh, the one way of putting it. Uh, one of my, one of my uh, competitors, Rebecca Mercer, will call it the Sanit sh shenanigans, and I think that was a very apt kind of expression. So from the beginning, when it was extremely tense and extremely unpleasant even to be at council meetings and watch, uh, what was going on, it's got to the stage now where on the surface what, what the public sees is is for the most part extremely respectful of one another and there's a lot more cooperation and it's not divided on what 
some people would call party lines, even though they're not parties in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, your background in fiscal expertise and accountability came out time and time again. It was a major plank in your platform. How do you intend to influence decisions in Saanich in that regard? Well, it's, it, it, that's a very interesting and very challenging question because going back to the original question that you just asked about operating at a strategic level as a governor, governors shouldn't be down in, in the weeds. And, of course, as a, as a bureaucrat at the Pension Corporation, I got to go down into the weeds and see. So I want to use that experience of knowing what can be accomplished in the weeds to try and help council recognize some some better ways of doing business and to provide instruction through through senior management to start working on ways to create efficiencies because I I already know from talking to staff that there are some some quick wins that we could have in terms of efficiencies let alone longer term longer term winning right we we're talking about shenanigans and referring to the spyware issue with Mayor Atwell that everybody knows and it went on for a long time so what was your impression because you were at some of those council meetings that were jammed to the rafters with citizens about that whole process well <clears throat> because because I was the chief knowledge officer at the pension corporation which in practical terms also part of my portfolio was being chief information officer so that means that I actually knew all about the privacy legislation and I was responsible for ensuring Pension Corporation dealt with it appropriately. So when this issue first came up, it really engaged my attention. I immediately went online and just, you know, checked out the, uh, the program that was being discussed and saw it was a keystroke logger and I was horrified mm. because uh, since 2004, under the, under the privacy legislation, it's been very clear that keystroke logger is keystroke loggers are illegal. You can't, I mean, even if you have a personnel problem, it's like the nth step to the nth degree and you have to go through all sorts of things in the first place. So the fact that Saanich felt comfortable putting it on anyone's uh, systems was astonishing to me, let alone the mayor's. And so um, I was, I was not surprised by the report of the Privacy Commissioner. That would be the, the very short version. And I actually had the privilege um, at when the report came out. That was the evening when the first, I believe, was the very first time that the public was allowed to speak on items that were on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And I was first up, and mm -hmm. I spoke to it. And that room was crammed full of people. It was crammed. There was, there was standing room only, literally, and so I spoke to the issues that I've just described, the fact that as a CIO, I could have written the report myself, mm -hmm. uh, that this is not new legislation, and that I was actually quite dumbfounded to think that, that I didn't understand how Saanich could have on any level thought that this was acceptable or to be or to be still defending it as some councillors continued to do at that point. So it was obvious why the uh, the attendance was so high but what about in general terms Karen what about the um, the process of engagement in Senate is it uh, resonating with you as it stands? It, it, engagement is a really interesting issue I think for any group of leaders and uh, <laughs> What I've concluded after 40 years of being involved, you know, on the union side and on management side and all and everything in between is that engagement doesn't happen easily and for the most part that's okay, mm -hmm. actually. Um, at the municipal level, I think most people get out, they vote for people that they want to do a very specific job. Municipal politics should be the bread and butter. It should be, in many people's minds, something that happens smoothly without really having to them having to do very much and um, so just as the night where we had the spyware um, issue coming forward people tend to come to council when they are concerned about things as opposed to just because of engagement so it's not that you can never engage people but you can't you certainly can't be engaging people all of the time they get tired mm -hmm. they absolutely get tired of it so you have to really pick pick your items about what you're going to engage them in and not be disappointed if you don't get a lot of engagement because in fact what that's telling me is if you don't see people out that you're probably doing something right yeah you're doing and if job. you and if you see a lot of people out something's wrong <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. At least in their minds, and you need to and you need to pay attention. Right. I attended one of the by-election candidate forums. First of all, there was an amazing crop um, of candidates. The the major concern for residents was the slow pace of development and high taxes. There was even a sign posted in Saanich saying go to Langford or start young, uh, very apt. How do you hope to reduce development conflicts? Well, as, as I said um, during my campaign and as part of my platform, part of the issue is that the local area plans, LAPs, are significantly out of date, in some cases 20 years. And so what's happening is the Saanich right now is dealing with development on a case-by-case -case basis. We need to be operating at a more strategic level, which is why the local area plans need updating. On the plus side, Council did recently pass a motion to expedite the renewal of those plans. On the downside, expedi expedited renewal involves seven years, which I think in most people's minds is way too long. Yeah. And I think that if we were to look at each of the area plans, there's only very limited areas where in fact you would be amending the, the local area plan. So I would hope that um, council can encourage staff through the CAO to find ways of making this faster by focusing on where the actual changes will be as opposed to the, the local area plans as a whole, because for the most part, the overall plans are probably still fine. And then there are some other areas like the Shelburne Valley <coughs> and Uptown where there's some very specific plans already in place. Mm -hmm. And so that's one aspect. The other aspect is I think we need to start looking at seeing if we can, can after having reviewed and updated the local area plans, if we can start doing business perhaps differently. And I was very encouraged last night at the public hearing that I attended to hear one of the councillors mention something that I've been interested in quite a long time, which is, I'll call it upzoning. In other words, once you get the local area plan in place, you put the zoning in place for the plan now. That's where you had the discussion with the neighbors. Mm -hmm. You have to have that discussion with the community. That's not ever going to go away. Mm -hmm. But then you create that discussion, you get to where you need to be, you, you put the zoning in place, and that means both neighbors and developers have certainty mm -hmm. about what they can expect. And that's <clears throat> part of the issue is right now, no one's quite always certain about what they can expect, and it creates really long delays for developers, and it creates a lot of angst for the public. So it's not good for either party. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. What about the EDPA, the Environmental Development Permit Area? There's been a lot of controversy about that. And actually, I think you were one of the people that said, you know, we can learn from our, our neighboring municipalities and even other cities like Edmonton or Ottawa mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on their approaches to that. Yeah. Well, in terms of the EDPA, I've been involved since the beginning, and I always say in the interest of full disclosure I got involved because my mother's property is in the EDPA okay. and um, a very small part of it luckily in her case but when I went and looked at the part of her property that was in the EDPA I thought hmm this is very odd because it's certainly not a sensitive environmental area for for the first 50 years the prop that was the that was the septic field on the property and now it's the sewer line that Saanich actually has a right of way through the property anyhow and so it's never going to be an issue that she's going to be able to develop beyond that but right. but it was more that if she's being told this is sensitive what are other people being told about their properties and and some people say, well, why does it matter if you're not going to develop? I would say to people who say that, aside from the fact that you as the owner do care about your property, and I would say the overwhelming majority of Saanich residents are environmental stewards of both their property and care about the environment. This isn't, isn't pro or anti-environmentalism in my mind yeah. at all. Yeah. We do want to protect what is truly sensitive in Saanich, but that's a matter of finding where that is. And I suspect and I, my belief is that doesn't tend to be people's front lawns and gardens. Right. So we need to have a different approach and we need to have a more uh, flexible approach towards it as well. And I, from my perspective, there's a report coming to council very soon, Diamond Head Consulting, and that report basically substantiates virtually all the concerns that have been raised about the EDPA. Great. Right. Oh, good. Thanks for the detail on that. I want to talk about uh, your time at the BC Pension Corp. You, you talked about being really proud about managing an effective organization, efficient, accountable, service-oriented, and that lots can be accomplished in the public sector when there's a willingness to look at things differently. Do you think we need more of that in Saanich? Yes, I do. And I think that it will be great for the Saanich residents, it will be great for council, and it will be great for staff. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of day, 
of the day, I believe everybody <laughs> wants to do the best of all possible jobs, but that does mean looking at ways of doing business differently, not just, if, if I said to you, why do you do this? And you said, we've done it since, yeah. which was the answer I used to get at the <laughs> pension corp. I said, no, no, that's how long we've done it. <laughs> why do we do it? And if you could do it differently, <clears throat> how would you do it differently? Mm -hmm. And again, as a counselor, I can't be in the Merck having those conversations, but I would I would be strongly encouraging through council, um, hopefully with council support, to get staff starting to look at themselves about how can they do business quite differently. And um, I can think of a, already of a number of areas where we could create efficiencies and have some quick wins. Great. Well, you talk about empowerment and that yes. leads into another interesting section. That'll be coming up after we take a quick break. I'm back with Karen Harper on Upfront. I've rarely seen so many good candidates, truly have been looking at politics for 40 years. So many good candidates in the Senate by-election, Karen, and uh, your closest rivalries were Rebecca Mercero and Natalie Chambers. What was your impression of the overall race, the tone? I thought it was very positive. Uh, the candidates um, on on a personal level got on fine with one another there was I don't think there were really any hidden things going at all which is great which mm -hmm. is not always the case in politics I understand I mean I'm not a I'm not <laughs> a, a career politician but um, no I thought that part was very, very positive and it, and it augurs really well for Saanich that there were so many mm -hmm. really good candidates uh, who ran and I am quite sure that many of them are going to run again. In fact, I know that many of them are going to run again, and I think that will be great in the upcoming election where we have the entire council up for re-election. Agree. How would you describe yourself as a leader? And, and maybe even more importantly, how would others describe you as a leader? You've led lots of teams. Well, um, <clears throat> I would describe myself as collaborative, as very approachable, uh, as someone who understands where we are strategically but can but also understands details which when you're um, when you're actually in the business you need to have both ends of it and but once I know the details are working I say to staff go away and make it happen mm -hmm. and so I believe in empowerment mm -hmm. of, of staff um, and I trust people as long as they show to me that they deserve to be trusted. One of my endorsements that you probably noticed was one of my former staff people. I did see and that. So, mm -hmm. I, in fact, I was quite... Um, and you didn't pay them any money. I didn't know. I <laughs> certainly didn't pay them any money. And, um, and the thing is, that was at the Pension Corporation, but I'm... But when I left the BC Teachers Federation where I was managing the disability plan, I have people that are, you know, who before they have still remained in touch with me, and it was the same approach. It's about, it's about listening to people, saying, how can we do it better, empowering them, and, and also saying, re let's always remember the most important thing we're doing is we're serving people, mm -hmm. and so we want that to be a positive experience, and I believe most staff always want to do the best that they can, and I operate from that premise. So I, I do lead, but, and at the end of the day, if push comes to shove, I'll take the decision and I'm prepared mm -hmm. to wear it. But I also back people up when they're in trouble if they deserve it. Mm -hmm. uh, you built a good succession plan, speaking of all this, at the Pension Corp. And you believe in term limits on council. How long and, and why? Well, I've, I've been thinking about that a lot. And since the government changed the, the term of councils from three years to four years, my personal bias is for two full terms. Um, and I can certainly make that commitment here, and I'm prepared to make it on the air that, you know, if I'm reelected, uh, I will not serve more than two full terms plus this by-election because I really believe that everyone starts from a really good place when they run for council, but you can get too attached to positions, too attached to believing that you know better than others. And I think, you know, you need some specific goals in place. You have to try to attain them. And if you've done that, great. And if you haven't, it's someone else's turn mm -hmm. to try and a achieve the goals that they have in mind. So I think two full terms, which is eight, is, is probably enough. Is that likely to happen? 
probably not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a realist, but I can at least make that personal commitment that I will be limiting myself to that if I'm successful. Well, speaking of this first year of all of that yeah. time, yeah. Uh, what do you think it's going to be like for you and others at the council table for Saanich? I mean, there's many challenges. There are many challenges, and, and one of the challenges is for me is I'm coming into a council that has been together for three years, that have developed relationships for three years, and even though I know many of them and I have a comfort level with many of them. It's, it's going to be a little peculiar, I am sure, for a while. Um, and, but I, I do want um, to, to try and find those points where we can agree because at the end of time, um, although I have three particular issues that I'm interested in, I can't achieve any of those goals unless I get the collaboration and cooperation of, of the rest of council. And so I will work to try and get that that's all I can do and that was always my strength in the past that I was able to work with people that I didn't always agree with because you find that sort of sweet spot and sort mm -hmm. of build on it. Mm -hmm. um, over to homeowners there were some issues that came up over and over during campaign time I know you mentioned and interestingly one of the biggest uh, concerns to many of them was dying trees property lines, and we've heard a lot of individual stories in Saanich about those issues. Why is it an issue? Well, for I'll, I'll share one, one ex well, I can share two examples, but I'll share um, one example where the homeowner was saying, you know, the, the tree is basically right on the property line. It's on the other person's side of the property line. So, of course, there's a root system. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is the root system has started eating into her foundation. And the current bylaw doesn't allow within the bylaw anything to be achieved. So she'll have to go to court mm. to try to deal with this issue. And I'm not saying it would be an easy amendment to the bylaw, but I do think we need to start looking at ways to say, okay, when there actually is damage to other people's property, when there's potential danger, I've seen ones where the trees are getting ready to fall on roofs mm -hmm. from a hill above and uh, again the bylaw doesn't permit them to come out because the trees aren't actually dead. Um, we need to have greater flexibility and in other municipalities there does appear to be that flexibility and it's not that people want to go around wholesale taking down trees but if you take down a tree you plant you plant another one mm -hmm. hopefully as mature as you can mm -hmm. you can get but the reality is, is <clears throat> trees die, we die, everybody dies and so if they're all of the same age in a neighborhood it might actually be a positive thing to take down one and replace with a younger tree so that you have varying ages in the canopy. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, for many Saanich residents, it was a tremendous loss to see the passing of Vic Derman, who was the former Saanich councillor. He was, uh, of course, well known as an advocate for the environment, sustainability. Uh, and I wonder, Karen, as we came up to the by-election, many people were saying, well, we've got to have another Vic Derman. Um, what do you have in common with what Vic was fighting for, if any? Well, there are people out there who will be really astonished to hear me say this, but actually Vic and I had more in common than we, than we didn't. Um, I've been involved in environmental issues since the 60s, dating myself obviously, <laughs> uh, including starting the recycling at, at Simon Fraser. I've been on many a march and I've always been concerned with the environment and, and, and done a number of things personally. My, my father-in-law actually had used to water his garden with water that he collected from the roof and so it's all good but I think that um, so what we share is a common concern about the sustainability of the planet and I think where we differed was is where should the emphasis be um, so the EDPA being the, the classic example where I absolutely agree we need to protect sensitive environmental areas and sanits that's never been the issue for me but it's actually identifying those issues um, and those areas and the way Saanich went about it didn't actually do that and that's where the conflict was created with a, um, an awful lot of the population that was immediately affected by that bylaw. So similarly whether it comes to traffic or cycling, I'm a cyclist, mm -hmm. I'm an avid cyclist, I cycled to work in Vancouver from downtown basically Coquitlam 
into That's downtown impressive. Vancouver, an hour <laughs> each way. And I cycled to work here for the 10 years I was at the Pension Corporation. So I am an environmentalist, and, but I think it's important to say, what can we do that will give us the biggest bang for the buck for helping us to save the planet? Mm -hmm. Because quite frankly, our generation hasn't done good things for the people who are coming behind us. Yeah, I think many people would agree with you yeah. on that. Absolutely. Uh, the transportation issue is, is big too in Senate. So, yeah. you know, a lot of concern about the congestion, traffic, cars. There's no easy answer to that either. No, there is no easy answer. And But to me, it also goes back to a different issue that we touched on, which is actually that's a regional issue. Mm -hmm. Saanich can't solve some of these problems on their own. True. And so we have this governance disconnect right now because we have 13 municipalities and a CRD and it's, one area can do something but then there's spillover effects in other areas. Even within Saanich there's spillover effects. So we need to have a more regional approach to transportation. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind if we're going to have any success in solving these problems. You have a well-rounded life. Uh, I know you've tried to find balance uh, along with your busy professional life and I know you're a cyclist. I know you like playing tennis for for many, many decades until you wrecked your shoulder, right? Yeah, That's a sad playing thing. tennis. <laughs> That's a sad thing. Um, and spending time with your husband, Paul, on your sailboat, and a love of knitting and sewing, and that is really calming. I know from, from doing those things myself. Um, tell me about your Vogue success. Well, I've had the, when I, I've had the privilege of um, working with some really special designers, um, because, so, for example, I've worked with someone who was the design director for Hardy Amy's in London on Savile Row, and I also worked with a man named Koos van den Acker who died recently, and that's actually how I ended up in Vogue Patterns. Uh, um, he was a New York designer who many people would recognize his work. He, he was really into doing interesting things with fabric. Um, but in any event, I've been sewing as many of us did as in high school and stuff we learned yeah. in school. But when I started getting really stressed at work many years ago, I thought I have to go back and do, do something. So I started sewing again, started taking a lot of courses. I was really privileged to start working with a woman named Kath, uh, Catherine Brenny, who is back in Ontario and she works with Vogue Patterns and she brings in all these designers to work with. So. Uh, that's how I got involved in it. We do really, really interesting things. I had to give up a trip, in fact, to England because of the by-election where we were going to be working in the New Forest on wow. a, a special project. But I'm wearing a dress that I, I made that. under the tutelage of, uh, of John. And uh, it's the most amazing fabric if you go, the crepe lifts. It's the lightest wow. weight crepe you could ever see. And we all designed, we actually draped them. We didn't use patterns to make these dresses. So it's uh, it's a really, uh, but anyhow, in terms of old patterns, I uh, it was a it's a really um, interesting lilac boiled wool jacket with all sorts of fabric attachments to it, and I get stopped on the street when I'm wearing it, saying, "That's great." And I say, "Oh, so yeah, it's really was interesting." They go, "You made it," but uh, yeah, I made it. It's it's. Sewing, in, for the guys in the audience, sewing is like construction. The most important thing about it is knowing how to adjust for size. Right. Because the skill, no, it's true. It's, it's all about fitting. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> and as long as you understand what your body shape is and you do your fitting, the rest is actually not all that hard. <laughs> well, thank you. Words of inspiration and a way to stay balanced. Thank Thanks you. very much for being with us on You're Upfront, welcome. Karen. We hope you've enjoyed the program. Every month, look for Upfront, a focus on leadership. Thanks for being with us. Bye-bye for now.